So that's it with the announcements. Thank you all for coming today. We're really happy to be back with you, our solar community. Um, before we get to our guests and the topic for today, I'd like to turn it over to Boa Soifer. He's the CEO of Bewa RE Solar Systems. He's going to give a quick hello and uh, say a few words. So good morning, Boaz. Great to see you. Welcome and take it away. Thank you. Good morning, Tom. Thanks to you and Jessica for organizing this event and to our panelists and attendees. Um, I'm excited to be here today with you. Um, I just got back from a hike, so I, I feel a little disheveled, but um, we'll, Great. we'll make it work. Mm -hmm. um, I, so obviously, you know, this topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in business and in the solar industry is extremely timely and important. I think that's obvious. Um, I, I think my contribution um, in this moment is to just mention how important I think work-life integration is in the context of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in particular, inclusion. Um, one of the things that, that we've experienced um, through the DEI work um, that we've done over the last year and a half, two years, is that... Um, until we start to empathize with people's individual experience, um, we can't really create an inclusive environment. And, um, and, it, and part of that empathizing is understanding and encouraging people to bring their whole selves to work. And when, when people experience having to leave a part of themselves at the door um, and, you know, don't bring politics into work or, or, you know, don't bring your, your personal opinions into work. Uh, we actually detract from our ability to create an inclusive environment. And so we're um, rethinking policies like, you know, what kind of content should we be sharing in our um, internal Slack channels? Um, where in the past we've said we should avoid political um, conversations. Uh, to the contrary now, we're thinking that uh, actually, um, in, in some situations, uh, political conversations are necessary for people to have in order to bring their um, whole selves forward and to be seen uh, completely. And, and being seen is a big part of this equation. So I just wanted to interject that. Um, it's just what I've been thinking about um, recently. Super excited for our panel, and uh, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Great. Thanks, Boaz. So today we will be talking about diversity and equity in the solar industry. We'll talk about how to bring solar to everyone, the imperative to bring solar to disadvantaged communities, and a lot more. Um, the topic is on the top of many people's minds right now, and it feels like this moment is a real opportunity to accelerate the change that we need in the solar industry and hopefully in the country as, as a whole. So we recognize that we still have a long way to go uh, to create a more diverse solar industry. But if you haven't considered bringing uh, a diversity and equity lens to your business, now is a great time to do it. We'll talk about how you can uh, accomplish that, um, the business benefits for bringing diversity, uh, both internally to your company, but also the economic benefits of, of selling solar in diverse communities. So it's a lot to take on, um, and we're really happy that we have a great lineup of guests to help us tackle this. Um, we do quite take questions as we go, um, so please, you can add them to the Q&A box, and our producer, Jessica, will collect them. So let's start to bring our guests up on screen here. Um, we have Jason Carney. He's the president at Tennessee Solar Energy Association, and he's the owner of Energy Electives, an installation company based in Nashville. Welcome to the town, town hall, Jason. Great to have you. We also have Anna Bautista. She's the VP of Construction at Grid Alternatives. Uh, we'll bring Anna up in just a moment. There she is. Great to see you uh, again, Anna. Thanks for coming. We're also excited to have Melanie Santiago Mosier. She's the Managing Director at Vote Solar. Um, she'll be coming on screen here. Thanks to you for joining us, Melanie. And we also have from the California Air Resources Board, we have Bart Crows. Uh, welcome, Bart. He's going to bring some of the, the policy angle for us and talk about data and pollution and a whole lot of other things. Great to have you, Bart. Melanie, 
I'd like to start with you this morning. Uh, Vote Solar works with communities around the country, um, around the United States at the state level. Can you give us a quick baseline to set the table for our conversation? Where are we as an industry from a diversity perspective? You know, how, how are we doing? Sure, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me on, it's a pleasure. So from a workforce perspective, I would say that solar has a lot of work to do. Right now, our industry doesn't reflect the makeup of the United States. According to the Solar Foundation 2019 Solar Industry Diversity Study, less than 8% of the people working in solar are Black or African American, but that compares to the national workforce, which is about 13% Black or African American. About 26% of employees in solar are women, compared to a national workforce that's about 47% women. About 17% of employees are in solar are Hispanic or Latinx, which actually is fairly close to the overall national makeup. In general, about 73% of the total solar workforce is white. Critically, when it comes to senior leadership at solar companies, 80% of senior leaders are men and 90% of senior leaders are white. So in terms of workforce, we're just overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. We also need to look at the diversity of, uh, in terms of who our customers are as well. When it comes to rooftop solar, a study last year found that our customers are also overwhelmingly white. So when comparing neighborhoods with the same household income and the same rates of home ownership, the study found that um, Majority black census tracts had 61% less solar installed than tracts that had no majority. And the majority Hispanic tracts had 45% less. White majority census tracts had 37% more solar installed rooftop wise than no majority tracts. So not only is our workforce overwhelmingly white, but the families who are benefiting from rooftop solar are as well. Great. Thanks, Melanie. Jason, I'd like to pop over to you. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you are the only NAPSIP certified African American solar installer in Tennessee. Is that still the case? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, <clears throat> that used to. And let me also pause and say uh, thank you, uh, Boaz, and especially Jessica, for having me on. Uh, but yes, that is um, definitely uh, true. It used to be, you know, Pioneering is a source of pride, but now it's, it's more, I'm looking for more. I want to see more. So I don't want to be the only, but currently, yes, we've, I've talked to many different people uh, and a lot of people uh, have said to me, I, I don't know any other. You're the only NAPSAP certified uh, uh, right. person in right. C. Yeah. So when, you know, uh, Melanie just gave us a baseline for the industry, I, I think the number was, you know, um, even when controlling for income, black neighborhoods have 69% less rooftop solar than uh, other non-majority neighborhoods. So, you know, even when we control for income, there's less solar in, in black neighborhoods. In your experience, you know, why, why is there that gap? And, you know, you know, how are you working to overcome that? Um, so my experience is, is kind of is pretty much the same most of the time that I'm doing solar work. It's, it's not for African-Americans and in my community, which is predominantly African-American, I'm the only house that has rooftop solar on it. Um, as far as, um, you know, why that is, I think that um, we understand um, the income and wealth gap uh, among the demographics. Um, but I think that income and wealth are not the same thing. The wealth gap is also a factor that even if the income is the same, um, black households tend to have more items tugging at their income uh, uh, such that they don't feel solar is affordable. Uh, so I think that, um, yeah, the incomes, it could be controlled for income, but I don't think it shows the whole picture on why uh, people feel like it, they're not ready to or able uh, to invest in solar. Right. And I think we'll come back to other reasons why communities aren't 
uh, adopting renewable energies at higher rates. Um, but Bart, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here um, and talk a bit about where um, certain communities, what certain communities are facing when it comes to adopting clean energy. Um, and the California Air Resources Board, or, or CARB, uh, of which you are a part, and the, the California Energy Commission, as a part of Senate Bill 350, uh, a, a Clean Energy and Pollution Reduction Act, um, CARB and CEC put out a number of reports, and these reports highlight structural barriers that disadvantaged communities face when they're trying to access clean transportation, renewable energy, energy efficiency programs. Um, and structural changes, structural barriers might not be a term that many of our audience are familiar with, but I, I think it's helpful to understand what communities are faced with when it comes to participating in what our industry is hoping to, to offer these communities. So if you wouldn't mind, would you please uh, define the, the structural barrier term and, and walk, walk us through some of the barriers outlined in the reports from CARB and, and CEC? So uh, structural barriers are, are just uh, systemic um, uh, conditions that you know would make it harder for people to take advantage of weatherization programs, of solar roof programs, um, um, and, and so you know electric car uh, chargers and things like that. So some of these include um, for low-income communities and communities of color is is a low home, home ownership rate. So if you're a renter, it's really hard to access some of these um, programs to improve energy efficiency because it really depends on, on the landlord. Um, also, these communities tend to be in apartment buildings where again, it's, you know, they don't own the, the unit, so it's harder to, um, to access these programs. And then if you own your home, uh, it's sometimes harder to um, access capital. Um, a lot of times the homes are older, so it's, it's just uh, more difficult to, to do um, the upgrades. And then in some areas like uh, tribal communities, it's just too remote an area. Um, and so it's just hard to, to access these programs. And then a lot of these programs don't really recognize um, some of the kind of non-energy health benefits. For example, you know, if you can have an all-electric home with, um, uh, you know, electric stove, electric um, heating, and um, then you're likely to have less indoor air pollution. And as a consequence, you're gonna have a healthy environment for your children and yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to come back to that indoor air pollution, because I think that's a really interesting topic. Um, Anna, I'd like to come to you now. Um, solar is often targeted, as we, as we talked about already, or as Melanie mentioned, um, you know, to usually white neighborhoods um, at a certain income level. Um, you know, why does that need to change? You know, let's figure out, let's talk about the baseline again. Why is it important to have diverse communities participate in the solar industry um, from the consumer side and from, you know, the workforce development side? Yeah, so thank you to Melanie for providing some of the statistics on the diversity side. I also want to throw in um, another statistic um, with regards to income. So nearly half, 43% of all technical potential for rooftop solar in the U.S. is on the roofs of low to moderate income households. And so ignoring the, uh, this LMI market is a big missed opportunity for the solar industry. So I just want to, to offer that statistic as well. Um, and in partnership with Vote Solar and the Center for Social Inclusion, um, Grid Alternatives, we developed a, a low income solar policy guide that I can include in the chat. And so, um, you know, really thinking about having the right policies in place to address that. So in terms of the case for diversity, uh, McKinsey, you know, McKinsey, folks refer to McKinsey on their studies. They already make the business case for diversity regarding market share and profitability. Melanie already mentioned about um, when controlling for income that uh, predominantly black na uh, neighborhoods and Latinx neighborhoods are seeing less solar installations. Um, and so diversity matters in terms of, you know, um, Jason brought this up as well, in terms of building consumer trust? You know, is your team culturally competent? Are they going to prioritize consumer protection or the consumer's best interest? Um, so that's kind of the kind of the business and the moral case for diversity. Mm -hmm. 
I would, I would just add real quick to that and a um, great point, and I would put innovation in there too, and I think McKinsey makes that case well also, that um, there's, there's clearly a, a correlation between having greater diversity in teams and those teams' ability to generate and execute new ideas, uh, which I think is very needed in all business communities now. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to that um, internal team, you know, what diversity can bring topic a little bit more and dig in there. Um, But Boaz, I'd like you to tackle a question that we got before the webinar today. This is from Martin. And I think it's in response to the title of our town hall. And the title is creating a diverse and equitable solar industry. And Martin asks, shouldn't we be past the creating stage? by now? And isn't there enough emphasis? And the second part of the question, the first part is, is obvious, shouldn't we be further? And the second part is, is there enough emphasis on business owners? So what are your thoughts on that? Should we be further along? And, you know, is the onus on business owners to create this change? I, yeah, I love, I love the question, both parts. Um, so shouldn't we be further along? Um, the word should is interesting. Um, I, I think um, a reason, and I, I mentioned this briefly when I was talking about work-life integration, but a, a reason that um, this kind of work is getting so much more attention now than, um, than in the past, I believe, is because of our ability to empathize um, more with the um, the experiences and histories of marginalized communities, marginalized people. Um, and I can't say why we're more able to empathize today than, than in the past. I, I think COVID is a factor. I think, you know, as, as we've all been, um, you know, working through a, a global pandemic and learning to work differently and seeing people work remotely with their kids running around in the background and, and, having to find ways to flex and, um, and then seeing COVID also disproportionately impact communities of color. Um, I think all of those kind of put more, more fissures in, in our mental models. And, um, and I think, should we, or, or shouldn't we, yeah, yeah, of course, right? Um, of course we should be further along. Um, I like to replace the word should with want in general, when I hear should, uh, when, I'm, when I'm shooting myself, I, sh- I should get more exercise, I should eat better. I want to get more exercise, I want to eat better, maybe or more productive. And I think that's the tipping point that we're at now where there's a real want um, emerging. Um, and the second part of the question is really powerful because uh, Martin asked about business owners, not business leaders but business owners. And that fundamentally then is a question about capital. Um, And how is capital going to get behind diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is a more important question uh, because it speaks to the systemic issues of how capital has um, created the systemic issues that we're experiencing. I mean, of course, people have as well, right, as a conduit. but um, the, the economic basis for, um, for, uh, for slavery, right, for starts, and, and then for, for the myriad um, uh, legislative decisions that have been made since then that have kind of reinforced um, the marginalization um, of uh, African Americans and, and other people of color, have the, those decisions have been capital driven to a large extent, or at least um, disguised through capital decisions. Mm-hmm. And, and so, yes, the, the answer to that is, of course, business owners, right? The, the capital needs to move towards um, new possibilities. And, and uh, I think the political will is, is clearly growing for that. I'm really curious to see how that pans out. Mm-hmm. Great. Thanks, Boaz. Uh, Melanie, I'd like to pop over to you. Um, let's make the business case for uh, diversity in the workplace uh, and, and in the workforce. Um, and I think especially if 
uh, leadership, people in the solo leadership roles aren't keyed into these studies. You know, Anna already mentioned them, but can you build that out for us? And can you talk about, you know, let's start to talk about what can solar contractors do in their businesses and their local communities uh, to start to, to build a more equitable solar industry? How is their time and money best spent? Sure. Um, well, I, I mean, really just to build off of what Anna was talking about and Boaz was, was talking about, it. there is a wealth of data out there about how companies with greater diversity and especially greater diversity on leadership teams really just simply have a better bottom line. Um, so one of the firms that I've seen is Boston Consulting Group, and they find that um, that greater diversity, especially when it comes to diversity of points of view, when it comes to important decision making, leads to greater innovation, leads to greater creativity and problem solving. And then that innovation and creativity leads to 20% plus higher revenues. So we're not talking about like a little bit better. We're talking meaningful impacts on your bottom line. So from a business perspective, is just a, a no-brainer. Um, I also want to echo what Boaz was talking about in terms of uh, inclusion because um, I think that a lot of companies make the mistake, um, and I've seen this a lot of data with regard to the environmental movement. A lot of organizations make the mistake of um, just pursuing diversity for diversity's sake. But if you're not taking an intentional look at your workplace culture, and the things that you're doing to make sure that everybody feels welcome, everybody feels like they can come to work and be who they are, um, then you are going to have a higher rate of turnover of the talent that you're attracting from different racial backgrounds, gender backgrounds, other types of identities. And they're going to tell their friends, and they're going to tell their friends. And this leads to a very, very bad cycle. So it's Diversity for its own sake um, is, is not going to lead to those higher profits, right? It's got to right. be diversity plus inclusion. Great. Anna, um, more about uh, diversity in the workplace. You know, one place that companies can really make a big impact is in their hiring practices. Um, and, you know, Grid has a very diverse staff, trains and hires a wide range of demographics. You know, what are some of the things in a potential hire's personal or professional history that might appear as red flags at first glance, but really deserve a closer look, more context? You know, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'll answer the specific hiring question, but I just want to continue off what Melanie said yes, about please. culture um, and really focusing on that first. Um, so in GRID's uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity statement, diversity is intentionally at the end, right? Like we need to really focus on equity and inclusive culture first um, or else we're not going to retain folks that we hire. Um, and so um, the Solar Foundation and SIA, they have, a, they offer the industry diversity guide and they have a best practices guide. Um, we can also throw that in the chat. And GRID's uh, journey over the last, I'd say, five years really reflects a lot of those lessons learned. And so in terms of having um, leadership buy-in, and so what are the values that leadership is establishing? And so at GRID, um, emotional safety is looped into physical safety. Um, or paired with physical safety as safety as one of our values, um, and then equity being very close and in hand, right? You can't really have equity and safety without the other. And then um, looking at your culture and assessing your culture, and is your culture really reflecting those values? And so we use Culture Amp um, as, a, um, as a survey device to check and see our staff having different experiences based on identity. Um, and all of these things are, um, you know, smaller and mid-sized companies can do. They're, um, you know, low or no cost, um, including tracking metrics, especially across hierarchy, which Melanie mentioned in terms of, you know, especially looking at your senior leadership and your C-suite grid. Um, we have... Um, as an organization, 60% people of color, 30% um, women of color. And when we look at our senior leadership, we're 50% people of color and 35% women of color. Um, but when we do look at our C-suite, though, it is all white and, and white passing. So there's definitely room for improvement. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, what trainings, what feedback and policy mechanisms are you building um, to support that culture? And so we've really benefited from the management center, which uh, 
provides training around people management skills with an equity lens. Um, we've done unconscious bias training. Um, and then we've just created, you know, KPIs, um, building equity into our KPIs, into our job descriptions, into our performance reviews. Um, and then just making space to have, you know, um, to develop relationships and create that trust so we can have these difficult conversations around race. So, you know, like in your culture, what are your decision making and conflict engagement processes um, so that, you know, you can make space for these types of conversations. I'm glad that we were on this journey beforehand. So when the um, uprising started to happen in the last month or so, right, like we could really uh, uh, it wasn't surprising to make space for our, our staff to process what was happening in the moment in the movement. So we intentionally had affinity groups to process what was happening. We had, um, we studied what the platforms were for the Black Lives Matter movement and we're like, how does our company and our industry need to respond? Um, and so now to get back to your specific question around sure. hiring, I think um, uh, one of our VIP folks on our team is our recruiter, um, right? And so one of the top ways a lot of folks look for jobs is through their personal and professional networks. And so the industry really needs to go beyond that. Um, and with GRID in terms of, you know, we're not just a solar contractor, but we're also a workforce developer uh, training organization. Um, and so in terms of our outreach programs, we're hitting outreach in high school at the university level, partnering with a, a historically black um, colleges and universities, tribal colleges, um, community-based organizations, community colleges, right? So it's like, uh, you know, really being intentional um, about, about the outreach. And in terms of the flags, um, we usually, with our employer partners, refer folks to the Roots and Rebound Fair Chance Hiring Toolkit. So when we're talking about systemic racism and structural, historical structural racism, um, you know, I'm based in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has the largest jail system in the world. Um, so we've started to focus a lot of our workforce development programs around supporting the reentry community. And so, you know, in California, it's already, um, we already can't ask applicants about their um, uh, their conviction history until after you make an offer. Um, but I want to, I'll throw this fair chance hiring toolkit into the, into the, um, into the chat box uh, for folks to, to see what other uh, tools are out there um, around, um, you know, background checks, what types of screens you can, um, you can collect. For myself, I'm going through my own um, hiring process now and, you know, trying to establish really key criteria and requirements in my hiring process so that, um, you know, I can really analyze my candidates side by side and just try to intercept any affinity bias I have, you know, like how are folks that I'm hiring really additive to my team, um, as Bo has mentioned in terms of innovation and problem solving. Um, yeah, so that's kind of <laughs> a lot thrown in there, but just wanted to throw in the contractor perspective. It's definitely been a journey. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, folks can look in the channel, um, in the chat channel, and, and Anna will share those links. Uh, I'd like to hop over to Jason, but Melanie, I just want to put uh, the seed in your mind. I, I want to chat a little bit about intentionality. Anna, Anna brought that up. Um, so I'm going to come back to you on, on how we can be more intentional uh, about creating a diverse environment. But Jason, I, I want to talk a little bit about contracting, which is, you know, a lot of what you do as well. And we talk a lot about, you know, the future of energy. Uh, and we continually ask the question, you know, what does the solar contractor of the future look like? You know, and you know, what will the contracting business look like in 10 years, the offerings of PV, storage, EVs, water heaters, all the things that we're going to be offering um, that we hope will make um, solar contractors more competitive. So one of the things that we're imagining is the solar contractor as an energy consultant, you know, and I want to I want to throw out that you're already doing this um, around energy efficiency. And I think this is a really interesting angle for solar contractors to think about. And here's my question. Can you talk a bit about the approach uh, from, you know, the energy, efficient pers energy efficiency perspective in the communities you work with? You, you got a certification as, as a BPI. You know, what, what type of the consulting might other people think about in this regard? And, and how are you thinking about it in terms of your business in the long term? Uh, yeah, so um, first I wanted to, it's such what you guys just spoke about previously, so uh, potent and pregnant. That Please, yeah. I wanted to say that um, I thought what 
um, boy has to say it was really important, um, especially from that position of, you know, executive level, CEO level to understand um, being seen uh, that that hits a little different as the young people say in the South where I am. Uh, it's, it's easy to, to be invisible and not seen and be feel irrelevant in these predominantly white spaces. Uh, and there is possibly, I have not come across a significant, if not effective advocate uh, for visibility uh, for people of color in the, in the corporate space. So, um, I think that was important and uh, just tracking along with what Melanie and Anna said, I, I think it's all that's very important. Um, to your uh, specific uh, question, um, hopefully the you know, solar contractor 10 years from now is increasingly more a person of color. So that hopefully is, is a part of it. Um, but yeah, I think that um, my approach is... Uh, always, you know, um, trust is important. So, you know, you're dealing with in a, in a residential uh, sector and you're dealing with homeowners and, and people who are putting their hard earned money into investing. And I think uh, possibly it was Anna that was talking about uh, one person talks to another person and it becomes, uh, you know, your brand, it becomes, uh, you know, the feedback. So if you don't have that trust with the the folks that you're working with, then, um, you know, you can just be very transactional and, and not grow. So um, I want to approach, although solar is my passion, I love it. Uh, I want to always approach uh, customers from a position of, let me give you best information that I possibly can, uh, could give you, which is that, you know, we all know in the energy, energy industry that your best quote, quote unquote bang for buck is energy efficiency. Um, uh, that's going to pay back faster than a solar installation. So um, I'm looking at giving you that information first. Although you came to talk to me about solar, uh, let me at least put this out there just in case um, you want to, you're an you're a investor, you're a, a return on investment type uh, person. So if I can do that and you, we may never even make it to solar. Um, but if we do, then great. My the ideal customer is to do a full package, try to get as close to net zero as possible. But I'd like to, uh, I like to offer both energy efficiency and solar so that we can try to catch all income levels. You know, if it's just $2,500 that you can invest or 7,000 or 25, 35,000, then uh, we want to uh, try to offer that full range of, of services. And I kind of think that I've listened to some previous uh, town halls and, and boys has already talked about this, about in the future that the solar contractor will be, you know, an energy consultant and be able to look at high efficiency HVAC and uh, smart thermostats and, and LED lighting and all of those things um, as a part of a, of a package. Uh, I think that, there is will possibly be some separation, you know, where solar folks that love solar will just do solar and be subcontractors to energy consultants. Um, and I think it can it can go both ways. You know, the solar contractor is doing that and decides, you know, we could offer lights too. That's you just twisting a light bulb in. So it may be that solar contractors have one or two things that they feel doesn't significantly in increase their job time. Uh, and, and add those uh, even here uh, when we had the initial sunshot, sunshot initiative and we had a democratic governor that was setting the state up for solar uh, and all these mom and pops popped up, they still came out of another industry. So they were HVAC contractors that added solar. They were roofing contractors that added a solar compor uh, component. So uh, I think that's where we're headed. And um, uh, I hope to be, you know, in that space where I'm looking at the full holistic picture. And that's why I went after, you know, these other energy certifications beside the solar. Right. And I just want to put a point on, you know, if you're looking at how to increase solar adoption in disadvantaged communities, one way to, to get your foot in the door and have them start to think about um, 
energy, how they use energy is to offer a kind of efficiency programs, which are much cheaper. They offer a good return uh, on, on, you know, for, in terms of energy savings. And then you can talk to them later about going solar, just like you said. Um, Bart, uh, along those lines, I, I'd like to hop over to you. And one thing that you and I talked about, and I want to come back to the, the global pollution levels and, and what, what we've seen during COVID-19, but you, you talked about indoor air pollution a little bit earlier. And I think a lot of people don't know about the health implications of this, but something clicked in my head around you know, what solar can maybe tie in when you talk about a home energy consultant. You know, maybe there's air quality monitoring or something like this that goes along. So you're selling like a, a healthy home, but can you talk to us about the impacts of indoor air pollution a little bit? And which communities tend to suffer the strongest impacts? So we spend about 90% of our time, you know, in our homes, schools, offices, um, in our transportation. And, and because of the shell of the building or the car, the pollution gets concentrated. So you can see levels of pollution two, five, even 100, up to 100 times higher than you see outdoors. And so we have this, what's called a rule of 1,000, that on average, um, a pollutant emitted indoor or released indoors is 1,000 times more likely to be inhaled than an air pollutant um, released outdoors. So, um, it's, so it's important to control the sources of pollution indoors. So, you know, there's, uh, there's obvious things like, you know, new paint or new carpet. Uh, with adhesives, um, but, you know, the big source indoors a lot of times is your gas stove. So, you know, two-thirds of the country has gas stoves. If you have a gas stove in your home, 24% uh, likely, uh, higher likelihood that, you know, your children are going to be asthmatic. 42, if your children are asthmatic, 42% higher probability that you're going to get an asthma attack. So, um, uh, you know, here in California, we've really been pushing all electric homes to, you know, basically eliminate indoor combustion. Now, you can mitigate this with more ventilation or with, um, you know, fume hoods, but, you know, especially in lower income communities, you know, the fume hood doesn't work or it's, you know, not big enough, not designed big enough for, for the gas stove or it's too noisy and people don't turn it on. Um, so, you know, generally children and communities, uh, low income communities, you know, where you have more people inside, you have older buildings, older stoves, um, poor ventilation. And in some cases, people actually use their gas stove to help heat their home, you know, if they have a, a broken or inefficient home heating system. So, um, there's a disproportionate environmental impact as well as a disproportionate environmental justice impact. And so um, we just feel like pushing to all electric um, homes is really the solution for this. That's great. Thanks, Bart. Thanks for that context. Melanie, um, I'd like to come back to you. And when we talk about, you know, how do we get broader adoption? How do we get to where BART is we're talk we're talking about with all energy homes for everybody, where renewable energy is an option in all of the communities in the U.S.? Um, can you talk about a, a bit about seeding, the idea of seeding? And I think this is really important because there are some strong implications. And then maybe also, if you can, dovetail that with how are we being intentional? Um, about the what we're trying to accomplish. Sure. So there, I, you, there are a couple of interesting threads here in your question, Tom. So um, first off, I, I just want to say that I really, really was excited by what Jason was talking about with regard to being holistic when we talk about the energy needs of uh, low wealth families and low wealth communities. Like I'm really in favor of that sort of across the board energy solution. Um, and that does to me kind of get to your question about seeding. So Jason also talked before when we were talking about the disparities across racial lines when it comes to the deployment of rooftop solar in the United States. Jason mentioned that there's a big difference between family income and family wealth. 
um, between communities of color and white communities. And I think that is a really, really important thing to keep in mind. But to your question of intentionality, I think this is where this concept of seeding comes in. That study that found that racial disparity of solar deployment actually did find that when communities of color are seeded, that means there are like those first one or two homes in the neighborhood, and then the rest of the neighborhood tends to go solar. So we all know this, right? We, we know that your, best that your best advertiser is your satisfied customer, right? You get one or two customers in a neighborhood to go solar, and then within a very short amount of time, there's this phenomenon that you have a whole solar neighborhood. That is actually the same case with communities of color. And the Tufts and Berkeley study that found those racial disparities in rooftop solar deployment across racial lines actually found that when communities of color are seeded, so again, like the first one or two homes in a neighborhood of color get solar, the neighborhood uptake of solar actually happens faster in those communities. So for me, there is a through line here of intentionality. I think that there may just be a lack of intentionality among our industry in terms of thinking about the customers that we're trying to serve, breaking down our biases, breaking down and, and interrogating what our business models are, what our sales models are, and why they are that way, and acting with intentionality to say, Communities across the board overwhelmingly want solar. That includes communities of color. That includes low wealth communities. And if we're not going out and being intentional and doing outreach and selling to communities of color, we are unfortunately and heartbreakingly, first off, leaving the opportunity for growth on the table, and secondly, heartbreakingly, replicating a lot of the systemic injustices, systemic racism, that has been rife within our entire energy system and our entire society for 400 plus years. So again, that kind of through line, I think, for intentionality goes to that seeding concept. That's great. Does anyone want to bounce off of that before I, before I switch topics just a little bit and start to wrap up? Okay. Yeah, I would kind of like to uh, yeah. bounce that a bit. Go for so, it. It kind of ties in something, you know, that what Melanie just said, which uh, I'm doing my best not to break my neck, bobbing my head at, in agreement with what you all are saying. Um, but what Boaz was saying and Melanie was saying about it, you know, this thing has its roots in the foundation of our country. So um, we've got to be clear about that and um, understand that uh, in the same way that the Civil War was won. It was won, you know, as Lincoln saw that we, we've got to include, you know, the, the slave and, the, and people of color in this war if we're going to fight it. So, you know, climate change is the, the biggest, to me, it's the sum of all movements, you know, it has health and social uh, uh, components, it has all of those things. And we have to do the same thing on that level of the, of the, of the Civil War and include all communities. Uh, so whatever barriers um, that have been in our minds toward, uh, you know, as Melanie said, have been systemic and historical to break through, we're going to have to bring everyone in. Um, and, th and that's the only way to win. We're not going to be able to win staying in our silos and staying in our comfortable zones. Uh, we're going to have to include everyone and, and say, we got to think of new ways. We've got to hand over the leadership to folks that we are not familiar with or, you know, don't have a history with uh, and say, you, you know, you have, we believe you have the ability to, to, to carry this fight forward. So um, I just think that that's, you know, really important in understanding how to change the, the tide uh, and the direction that we're going. Again, I'm, I'm here in the South where I'm under the thumb of TVA and it's, literally an act of Congress to make them move. It's not hyperbole. So um, to, to, to do this, everyone's mm -hmm. got to be engaged and, um, and we've got to open up the, the doors for other people to join, the, uh, to join the fight and get the benefits so they can see it. What Melanie said about um, 
one one neighborhood and then it kind of proliferates from there or one house in the neighborhood and it proliferates from there you know everywhere i go everyone is like we love this we we want this we you know it's we, it was a study in tennessee that 88 percent of tennesseans want more solar and we probably got you know as far as uh der as far as you know, distributed uh, rooftop we probably one of the lowest you know just right. because the gatekeepers don't want it you know the, the big tva wants it to all be big and centralized so they can kind of control it and that's just a bad business model that's the old way uh that's not going to get us where we need to be as far as uh, climate change and as far as lifting up communities of color and, and giving them the autonomy that they need to thrive right mm -hmm. I love that you brought up climate change because I'd like to actually ask Jessica to share some slides. And I want to talk about, you know, what we're all doing here, you know, at the community level, at the state level, but also at the global level. And I'm sure we've all seen these already, but, you know, these are air pollution levels during COVID-19. Um, and we could see the drastic reduction in pollution. Uh, can we see the next slide, please? We can just zip through these. I'm sure we've all seen them. Um, uh, we, we see, you know, Italy here, huge reductions in pollution levels. Europe in general, again, go to the next slide. India, bottom right, reduction in pollution levels. See the next slide. China, Wuhan. And then let's look at where we're, we're heading back to. You know, we're seeing levels come back up to, you know, pre-COVID pollution levels. Um, thanks, Jessica, for sharing these slides. Um, so if you bring us all back, yeah. Um, so I want to share those slides to talk about, you know, the biggest reason why all of us are here, you know, is to provide a cleaner energy sources, you know, for a cleaner future. And for me, these images show, you know, what is possible, uh, which is kind of incredible to have visuals like that right now. Um, but beyond clean air, the images also tell the story of billions of people who are suffering health consequences from air pollution, who are more susceptible to the effects of the coronavirus, uh, the impacts of climate change. So if we want to talk about what solar deployment can bring, you know, this is part of this is part of this conversation of why should we try to bring solar to all households, you know, and we need to recognize that the most vulnerable, you know, are the ones without access to renewable energy, you know, are the communities that are most heavily impacted. So Bart, I'd like to come back to you uh, as we start to wrap up and, you know, Talk about uh, talk about the the charts we just saw pollution and health impacts you know at the community level. But what goes through your mind? You know, what are the striking examples of health outcomes uh, for communities in terms of what we just looked at, and you know what what solar you know and clean energy can help alleviate? So, uh, in a few cases, you showed the the visible air pollution, and and that's generally particles that we. Uh, very small ones that we can inhale deep into our lungs. So they cause respiratory problems like pneumonia, other lower respiratory infections, uh, lung cancer, but also they cause uh, cardiac problems. So, you know, strokes and heart disease. Um, and then now, you know, more recent studies have linked it to things like diabetes, uh, dementia, you know, kidney disease, um, hypertension. And so throughout the world, the estimate is that outdoor air pollution causes about 9 million deaths a year. Um, indoor pollution, you know, mostly in uh, developing countries, you know, where they're using open fires indoors, that leads to another 4 million deaths a year. So, so pretty profound impacts. Uh, even in the United States, where we've cleaned up um, air pollution, you know, to um, you know, by 90% or more, we're still experiencing about 200,000 deaths per year just from outdoor air pollution. So anything we can do for a clean energy future, you know, to prevent, um, you know, tailpipe and smokestack pollution is going to reduce that burden. And that burden disproportionately impacts uh, communities of color and low-income communities, you know, one, because they tend to live closer to the sources like freeways and, and power plants and refineries, um, but also because of, you know, things like less access to um, healthy foods or health care, um, you know, it's just not able to deal with that, that burden. 
So, you know, we've seen in California, you know, these communities in the past experienced a levels three times higher than, than higher income communities. That disparity has narrowed as, you know, we've cleaned up pollution sources, but there's still a significant disparity that, that the state is trying to deal with. And, and, and you know, we see that throughout the country as well. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you have, um, you know, climate change. So, that, so climate change can make um, pollution worse. So we've seen um, in the United States that we had this dramatic progress since the Clean Air Act was adopted in, in 1970. You know, but then basically the progress on air pollution stopped about five years ago. Um, you know, partially due to climate change, you know, partially due to just uh, less enforcement. Um, um, but, you know, we really need to try to deal with this. Um, and then, of course, uh, climate change has, you know, uh, much more serious impacts, you know, like um, drought and sea level rise that, um, you know, are going to displace populations and, uh, you know, make it harder to feed the world. So, yeah. um, you know, that's why we're all invested in this clean energy future. You know, this is a very slow moving pandemic um, of climate change. You know, we're not going to be able to realize 20 or 30 years from now, um, you know, that we need to, to prevent these impacts. We really have to make these changes starting now. Great. Thanks, Bart. Um, that was a lot, you know, to process, I think, at least for me. Uh, so I want to talk about some of the things and the actions that we could do uh, to make the future that we want. Um, Melanie, I'd like to, to come over to you and then wrap up with everybody's three ideas about what we can do um, to create the world we want. But um, bringing solar into the fold, you know, it's a complicated problem. You know, as we've discussed, there are many uh, facets to this. Uh, for a contractor audience, I think, it, you know, better hiring practices, diversity initiatives, the things we've talked about are great ways to support these efforts. But Melanie, you know, often the to make the change we need, and I, I'm forgetting who brought this up, maybe it was Jason, others need to maybe step aside, you know, and let others come forward. Um, what are your comments on that? If so, you know, do you agree with it? What What does that look like to you? When should people be stepping aside to make more room? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, totally building off of what Jason was talking about. Um, there are universes of untapped solar potential in communities of color, in environmental justice communities, and other under-resourced communities across the country. Um, we're, we've been fortunate to be able to partner with organizations like Grid Alternatives who are interfacing with those communities on a daily basis we partner with the NAACP. So I think Vote Solar has been able to take a very humble position and be in a listening posture. And I think that that, for me, is very instructive, um, that there are so many community leaders out there who are working every single day to build a more equitable clean energy movement and to ensure that solar benefits are reaching the people that need them the most. So as Jason talked about, if we need, if we're going to be able to achieve a clean energy future, we need to be learning from and engaging thoughtfully with communities on the front lines. I, I, I've thought about this in terms of like climate change as a tide, right? And we're rowing in a boat. To turn the tide against climate change, we need every person rowing with us. So that thoughtful, intentional engagement doesn't mean that we're sitting in the front of the boat with a megaphone telling everybody what the solution is and what they need to do. Getting everybody to row together means partnering with humility and with respect with people on the ground who understand these challenges in ways that we can't possibly fathom. So we need to be building processes to ensure that our work is really informed by their needs and by their vision for a clean energy future. So for me, you know, in terms of how to start, this is very something that I think every solar installer can do in their communities today. You can start by simply doing a little more listening. Start by reaching out to trusted community leaders who are in under-resourced communities where you are just to have a conversation, to start building some trust, 
to start listening to the needs of those communities and figuring out how you can work together. And that all combines to this turning the tide. We're all rowing together. In addition to that, um, my organization, Grid Alternatives, other organizations around the country are working on the policy platforms that we need to be able to make sure that everybody is benefiting from solar. So for 20 years, Vote Solar has been partnering with the solar industry on critical policies like net metering, incentives, renewable portfolio standards, good utility rate design. Um, but we're undergoing a journey to figure out that we, we need to be, again, listening to communities and know that we need to be, be building out and um, acting and advocating for more policies, better policies, to make sure that solar's benefits are spread more equitably, again, to communities that we need with us, communities who really need the benefits of solar. And so I would ask also for the solar community to be partnering with us as we work for those more inclusive and equitable policies. Great. We only have about a minute left. So I'd actually like all of our guests, uh, well, Bart, Jason, and Anna, to share one more suggestion uh, for what solar contractors should take away from this conversation, how they can make an impact, um, where they should be focused. Uh, maybe Anna, let's bounce to you first. Sure. I'm just going to plus one on Melanie's um, listen. Um, the Black Indigenous leadership have specific demands of our industry during this time that we can go beyond our solidarity statements. So I'm going to copy and paste the message from the American Association of Blacks and Energy and their call for, um, for our industry. Thanks. Great. Jason, let's popcorn over to you. Yeah. So I think, again, uh, segueing off of Melanie, or what she said previously and just now, um, I think the industry needs to understand that there is a bigger pie out there. And so if we open up to other communities, it actually, it's not a zero sum game. And if we can actually grow the pie and make it profitable for all of us. Great. Bart, last thought. So solar saves energy, saves you money, saves the climate, but it also saves your personal health. So if you could, just emphasize, um, you know, the benefits of a combustion-free household. I think that would be a, an important addition to what you're doing already. Great, thanks. Um, we're going to bounce over to Boaz uh, to to send us off. But I'd like to thank each of our guests for coming today. Um, really appreciate it. We had Jason Carney. Uh, he's the president of Tennessee Solar Energy Association and owner of Energy Electives. Thank you for joining us. Anna Bautista, VP of Construction and Grid Alternatives. As always, good to see you. Melanie Santiago Mosier, Managing Director of Vote Solar. Thanks for joining us. From the California Air Resources Board, Bart, great to, to meet you and have you on the show. Thank you very much for your unique perspective. We really appreciate it. So thanks everybody for coming. I'll hand it over to Boaz to say goodbye. A really important conversation today. Please share it. Um, we're gonna be sharing the recording and you can uh, listen to it on the podcast as well. So thanks, yep. Boaz, take it away. Thank you, Tom. And yeah, that was an awesome panel. I wish we had two or three more hours to um, dig into some of the topics that came up today. Um, it's it's kind of too much to summarize. Um, so, uh, I, I'm just going to share a couple of things that I'm walking away with. Um, I loved Anna's comment about inclusion um, and equity coming first and diversity second. Um, and that really speaks to all of us working on our organizational cultures um, so that we do create the psychological safety um, and emotional safety for anybody to be themselves in our organizations. And I believe when we build that, we're going to attract what we resonate and will attract diversity because we'll be a safe place for it. Um, I also really loved the comments that, um, that came from a couple of our panelists in particular, I think Jason and Melanie were talking about low wealth communities as opposed to low income communities and that important distinction and thinking about um, offering a range of solutions um, that influence low wealth communities as well, both to address climate change and to address um, continued impacts of um, systemic racism and systemic marginalization. Um, the solutions we create need to be for everybody to really be solutions. 
Um, and along those lines, I'm thinking about new business models. That's been a conversation in Bewa for the last couple of months um, that would allow us to play a more active role um, in a broader community. And then the comments from, from everybody, um, Bart brought them home in a unique way about um, tying environmental and social justice together um, and, and really seeing climate change um, as both a pandemic and, um, at, and as a social justice issue that, um, that we want to think about more broadly as a solar community. So yeah, really awesome panel. I can't wait to watch the video and take better notes. Um, and check out some of the links that Anna was sharing. And um, yeah, thank you all again. I'm looking forward to next time.